May I have your attention, please? I have a very pleasant but very brief duty to perform, and that is to introduce Brian Greenspan, who is co-chairman with Mike Moldaver of these criminal law evening session programs. This is the third year, the third fall, in which Brian and Mike have co-chaired this series of uh, evening lectures and panels. Now, very quickly, uh, Brian Greenspan had the good sense to go to the Osgood Hall Law School from which he graduated in 1971. He then went to the London School of Economics where he received his Master of Laws degree in 1972 and he traveled there on a Laid Law Foundation Fellowship. He's called the bar in 1974 after having survived the rigors of the, of the bar admission course. He has participated in the Federation of Law Society's refresher programs in criminal procedure and the uh, criminal evidence program we did in Saskatoon last summer. Uh, he has lectured both here and at Osgood Hall in criminal law and in other series programs. He has practiced criminal law exclusively since 1974 and he is going to say a few words to introduce his panel and the evening will get underway. Thank you. Thank you. Just a few words of introduction generally. As has been the pattern in the past, the seminars this year are intended to be practice oriented and as a result there will be a very limited amount of material distributed each week. There is a verbatim reporting taking place of the entire proceedings. Those proceedings will be edited and then forwarded to you hopefully in a shorter period of time than they were two years ago. On behalf of Michael and myself at the outset I would like to thank someone in particular and that's Ruth Windler of the Law Society uh, most of the programs that are organized for continuing education really are Ruth's programs with other persons' names on the programs, and we extend our thanks to her. The first week is the prosecution and defense of sexual offenses. The only unanimous suggestion that was made in the evaluation forms of last year was that Michael and I refrain completely from attempting to be humorous. So I will get to the introductions as briefly as possible. The moderator for this evening is Alan Cooper, Assistant Crown Attorney in Toronto, graduated in 1971 from Queen's University, uh, his Bachelor of Law degree and called to the bar in 1973. He was with the Federal Department of Justice, 1973 to 1974, and the Crown Attorney's Office of the Judicial District of York since that time. To his right, the Honorable Mr. Justice Galligan, and I have a four-page summary of Mr. Justice Galligan's curriculum vitae, and one of the, perhaps, or of the many interesting uh, aspects of Mr. Justice Galligan's background, some of the little-known facts relate very much to the criminal law. After graduation from Osgood Hall in 1956, I think it's interesting to note that he articled for a year with G. Arthur Martin, now Mr. Justice Martin, also articled with Arthur Maloney. So his background as an articling student was certainly in the criminal law. In 1957 to 1970, he practiced in Ottawa as a partner in the firm of Soloway, Wright, Houston, Galligan, and McKim. In February 1970, was appointed to the Supreme Court of Ontario. It might also indicate that while in Ottawa, from 1960 to 1967, he was a lecturer in criminal law at the University of Ottawa Law School, and from 1967 to 1970, a lecturer in evidence at the same law school. Moving to Mr. Justice Galligan's right, Peter McWilliams, QC, graduated in 1949 from Harvard University, then from Osgoode Hall, and called to the bar in 1953. In private practice in Milton from 1953 to 1958, the Crown Attorney of Halton County from 1958 to 1968. He was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1968 
He's a bencher of the Law Society and certainly the very well-known author of Canadian Criminal Evidence. Moving to the left of the moderator, <coughs> Bonnie Wine, graduated, an undergraduate at York University, 1972, 1975 from Osgood Hall Law School and called to the bar in 1977. She has been since that time and during her articles with the Attorney General's Department, particularly involved in appellate practice. And most noteworthy with respect to this particular evening was Crown Counsel on the Forsyth case. Defense Counsel on the Forsyth case is on the far left, Keith Wright, Bachelor of Science degree in 1968, graduated in, from Osgoode Hall in 1973, called to the bar in 1975, and in private practice specializing in criminal law since that time. He's authored a number of articles, The Use of Prerogative Writs, Forgetfulness as a Defense to Fail to Appear, and Forgetfulness Revisited. Those are the introductions, and I welcome the panel tonight. Thank you uh, very much, Brian. I hope everyone can hear me. If not, please uh, let me know. I should say that there's a, a handout, I hope you all got it, uh, of two pages of cases, which uh, Bonnie Wine's excellent suggestion that you get it so that uh, you won't be taking the time to scribble down all the citations we might otherwise give you. Uh, also, uh, I spoke to uh, Brian Greenspan, and uh, he's asked that if uh, you'd refrain asking questions, perhaps to the very end, and hopefully we'll have some time if there are problems that are bothering you at that time. Although the uh, topic is sexual offenses, the primary one we'll deal with tonight is that of rape. Rape has been referred to as the least studied and most myth-ridden of all crimes. Now this description, at least in my view, is becoming less apt than ever before, because in the last few years, the feminist movement has turned the public's attention to this crime, which in turn has prompted changes in public attitudes as well as changes in the law towards rape. Now, one significant legal change that occurred in 1977 was the Supreme Court's decision in Leary and the Queen, which basically held that rape it's no longer a crime, if it ever was, of specific intent, so that intoxication, by whatever means, could not eradicate specific intent. Now that completely reversed the case laws it then was in Ontario, which unlike B.C. and Boucher, held that rape was a crime of specific intent. As well, then there were the amendments to the criminal code, uh, which included the enactment of the present 142, and uh, the decision it was the gloss on the new 142 Virginia and Camp, which we'll deal with later, where our Court of Appeal decided that by repealing former 142, Parliament had laid to rest the requirement of the not safe to convict warning. Now, from a prosecution point of view, uh, most of these changes were welcome. They were favorable. And again, in my view, this has resulted in a greater number of convictions for rape. Well, it's still not easy to obtain such a conviction, but it, it's made it a lot easier because of these changes. And overall, it seems that Parliament and the courts are reflecting a less tolerant view of rape in response to the public at large. Rape crisis centers have sprung up and to some extent receive uh, government funding. Although the sentences vary widely for rape, in the last few years, our Court of Appeal has upheld several life sentences for this offense, especially where the psychiatric prognosis for rehabilitation has been slim. Now, from a defense point of view, and I must, uh, Bonnie Wine and I must gear ourselves towards what's probably a majority here tonight and temper our otherwise intemperate crown remarks. And uh, from a defense point of view, rape has traditionally been viewed with a great deal of suspicion. I'll read from page 421 of the Tech Canadian Criminal Evidence by the learned author Peter McWilliams, one of our panelists. There's going to be an update soon, I'm promised, by Mr. McWilliams. He first quotes the classic statement from Hale's Pleas of the Crown. He says, but it must be remembered that it is an accusation easily to be made and hard to be proved and harder to be defended by the party accused 
though never so innocent. And he further quotes from Glanville Williams from his article, Corroboration in Sexual Cases, the 1962 Criminal Law Review. There's a sound reason for this, the common law rule regarding corroboration, because sexual cases are particularly subject to the danger of deliberately false charges resulting from sexual neurosis, fantasy, jealousy, spite, or simply a girl's refusal to admit that she consented to an act of which she's now ashamed. So the, rare, the very real danger exists that a trumped up charge may have been laid due to some sinister motive. Now from time to time one sees a complainant prosecuted for public mischief uh, where the falsity of the allegations was established, but uh, such fabrication, such evidence of such fabrication is hard to come by. So the prosecutor is expected to do his or her utmost to protect the public from those who rape others. The defense, on the other hand, is expected to do his or her most to ensure that no innocent person or anyone against whom the evidence falls short of that standard required by law is convicted. So as you can see, either side is charged with a very great responsibility in this type of case. It's a unique crime, one with many challenges, which in my view, if met head on and overcome, and leave you with a great deal of satisfaction, be you a prosecutor or a defense counsel. Tonight we will discuss three aspects of sexual offenses, which we all hope will be of some assistance to you in the courtroom. And the first topic that we'd like to deal with is that of 142 hearings, which was enacted in 1975 to replace the former 142, and there's a plethora of case law which has come up around this particular subject. Now, to begin, uh, it only deals with four type of offenses. Rape, attempt rape, female under 14, and decent assault female. It only limits the defense from asking those questions so that theoretically, the judge or the crown could get into this area that's prohibited to the defense. Now, why they'd ever want to is, is uh, hard to think of, but uh, they could if they wanted to. Another point is that it applies to all witnesses. So that the defense tries to ask the complainant about her past sexual activity without going through 142, they can't do it. If they try to ask other witnesses other than the complainant about the complainant's sexual background, they can't do it unless they go through 142. If they want to ask those witnesses other than the complainant about their own sexual escapades, if they have any, they have to go through 142. So you see, it's not just limited to the complainant. And the last point is that it's clear now after the Forsyth uh, decided in the Supreme Court of Canada not so long ago that it applies, that is 142 questions, apply to preliminary hearings. So we have these four offenses that I mentioned covered by section 142. What about those that aren't covered by section 142? And perhaps I can call upon Bonnie Wine, tell us what the law is if it's not, for those offenses not covered by Section 142. I think the easiest way to deal with, the easiest way to deal with a case that doesn't deal with Section 142. Can everyone that, hear? That isn't one of the four sections set out in Section 142 is to look at the decision of the Alberta Court of Appeal in Regina and Moulton. And there's a very short summary in that case of the categories of prior sexual conduct and the common law that applies to each. Basically, it breaks down into four categories. The first is previous acts of sexual intercourse with other persons at common law. The complainant could refuse to answer questions in that category. It was a collateral matter going only to credibility, uh, a denial if she chose to answer or was instructed to answer uh, could not be rebutted by extrinsic evidence. The second category and, and one that I think in light of some of Mr. Or Chief Justice Laskin's comments in Forsyth is, is one that's still important, perhaps even in the context of 142 is the category of general reputation for chastity, questions about prostitution, as in the Krauss case, 
In that case, the complainant was bound to answer. Her answer could be contradicted by extrinsic evidence, uh, perhaps in some circumstances subject to the trial judge's discretion, uh, but that may be a very limited discretion. The third category is in relation to previous acts with the accused himself. In that case, the complainant was bound to answer. Her answer could be contradicted, and that situation, of course, even in cases which fall into 142, uh, is simply not covered by Section 142. The fourth category is really a rule of evidence. Uh, it held that independent evidence couldn't be given unless the complainant was first faced with a question. So it was re really a rule of procedural fairness and still in existence. So that, uh, Bonnie, those offenses that aren't covered by 142, basically these uh, um, tired warriors of the courts, if they don't want to read every case on point, could just look at the Moulton case, which is mentioned in your table of cases, and they could find those common law rules that apply. I think that's a good place to start, and there's a reference back to some of the English common law cases. All right. Uh, Moulton is set out on under the cases prosecution and defense of sexual cases, case law, section 142. At least I believe it is. Yes, second case there. Well, on the, uh, the first category mentioned by Bonnie, I uh, think that it might be worthwhile to take a look at uh, La Liberté. I'm not sure whether it's in our list of cases or not. It's in uh, Old, the old first volume Supreme Court reports in 1877. Um, that case seems to suggest that dealing with the question of sexual intercourse with persons other than the accused, the discretion may reside in the trial judge, not in the witness. And it may be a distinction without a difference. It may be a distinction worth noting because there is an article, I don't have the citations, in Chitty's Law Journal by Mr. Justice Haynes, where uh, he uh, seems to cite cases which are authority for the proposition that the witness herself may decide whether or not she wants to answer these questions. And it would seem that a good argument can be made that it's not up to her to make that decision, it's up to the trial judge. As I understand La Liberté, the question could be put by defense counsel, but the judge then said, wait a minute, Madam Complainant, you don't have to answer. Is that right? The judge has that discretion, at least he did. And he, he seems to have the discretion to decide whether or not to require the answer, yes. All right. Now, the next point, uh, what happens if an indictment has two charges on it? One is one of the offenses mentioned in 142, rape, attempt rape, sex with a female under 14, or indecent assault female, but also added to the indictment is one not covered by section 142, such as choking. Now, that very situation arose in the case of Delorier. And uh, eminent counsel on that case for at least a couple of the uh, bounces up and back from the Supreme Court was uh, Peter McWilliams. And perhaps, Peter, you could uh, discuss the Delorier case a bit. That's mentioned in the table of cases, too. It's yes. on the same page, about <clears throat> six from the bottom. It all depends whether you're Crown counsel or defense counsel. If you're Crown counsel, you might be well advised to sever the indictment. And, uh, but. Uh, it, it, it creates difficulties uh, because the uh, section 142 uh, requires uh, different conditions uh, for the, uh, to be satisfied as to the uh, admissibility of, uh, uh, or at least the permission to ask the questions uh, covered in the section. And uh, it might well be that uh, a ruling uh, could be made uh, that uh, the questions can be asked, uh, certain questions, and yet, on the, on the, that is on the one uh, count coming within section 142, and the, on the others that uh, counsel should have a, an unrestricted uh, right to question. Uh, and so it, uh, it really leads to problems that should be avoided. So Peter, if uh, some uh, lucky defense counsel happens on a case where he sees an indictment uh, charging his client with rape and choking, we'll say, with choking not being a 142 defense. Does he have to even bother? That does the defense counsel even have to bother with going through 142 at all? That's a real problem. I, I, I don't know. I read, and I may be wrong, the, uh, I thought that if those two offenses were combined, the defense counsel was his lucky day, and, and he could uh, didn't have to go through 142. Do the other panelists care to comment well, on that? Well, in Delorier, because the, the, there was an attempt to comply with Section 142, 
and uh, it, uh, at any rate, th that was the ground of appeal which was successful that the judge shouldn't have permitted the trial to be joined. And Victoria eventually went back to trial and he was acquitted, I think, on the third time round of him. That's right. I didn't take him the third time round. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I didn't mean to put that uh, inference on there. I, I think I should point out for Crown Counsel who are present that it's not, in my view, in all situations like Delorier where you have to sever. Uh, that's obviously the, the proper course to take where a question of prior sexual conduct may be applicable to a non-142 offense. But I, I note that in the Moulton case, the charges were rape and assault bodily harm, and I, I think it could be argued that there's no way that prior sexual conduct could be relevant to the second charge, so I don't see why the Crown would need to sever in that situation. There might be if the rape laws are changed to, uh, so that it becomes an offense just of uh, sexual violence. All right. Now, Peter, perhaps you could tell us what formal requirements have to be met dealing with notice under 142.1a. What do the defense have to do to try to uh, get this whole process in action under 142? Well, I, uh, they have to look at the section, which I haven't done at the moment. <laughs> uh, read the section very, uh, very carefully every time. <laughs> Because it, 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 it seems to require a twofold uh, requirement that uh, it, it's the intention to ask such question together with particulars of the evidence sought to be adduced. And it's hard to figure out just what that means. Uh, it, it concerns cross examination, and, and uh, very few counsel ever have their cross-examination all set out in advance to the point where they have every question uh, provided for. They have some basic questions and uh, then they go on from those uh, as things develop. But uh, I think all you can expect uh, is a general question with a general uh, statement of the evidence that you're, uh, or at least the particulars that you, uh, of the evidence that you seek to adduce. Uh, it, it requires considerable care in drafting these and... Uh, Does it have to be in writing? Oh, I would say it should be in writing. It's expressly stated that it has to be in writing. And... Uh, yeah. I'm, trying to get you I'm to sure you can, you can read it as well as I can, <laughs> that you have to file it with the clerk. Now, someone like Keith Wright has been telling me uh, that you have to make very sure you file it with the clerk of the right court. Uh, that is the clerk of the provincial court if you're on a preliminary or if you're on a um, trial that it should be the clerk. I suppose it could be the, the general sessions of the peace depending if you're in the general sessions or, or the uh, local registrar if you're in the uh, Supreme Court. Or that is if you're worried about Crown Council being technical. Not that I would expect a trial judge to have much sympathy with Council like that. The, uh, but you should uh, maybe, uh, if, if you, even if you raise it on the preliminary, you should still file it again at the, at the county or Supreme Court uh, clerk's office. So notice uh, to the clerk of that particular court, notice to the prosecutor, and it yes, has to be in writing. Uh, that's right. All that's right. right. I forgot to notice the prosecutor. Um, now, Keith Wright did mention this. Uh, and I, perhaps Keith could comment on it. Uh, the question applies, uh, is that if you have a preliminary hearing, as most always will in a, in a rape case, and you serve notice before the preliminary hearing, is that good enough for the trial? Now, I would have thought that it would have because the main import, I thought, of notice is to give the other side uh, advance awareness of what the application's all about. So that I, as a Crown, certainly wouldn't insist upon a new one, but. Keith, I think, takes the position that some crafty Crown Counsel or some around that uh, might be technical at the trial and say, because Section 142A says, and filed with the clerk of the court, that it means that particular court where he's being tried and not the provincial court where the preliminary hearing was held. Keith, do you care to comment on that further? Well, I think, Al, it has to be the, the better procedure, both uh, from the point of view of making sure you've got your 
I's dotted and your T's crossed, so to speak, in dealing with these technical uh, matters. Uh, I uh, have been known on occasion to uh, insist that the Crown uh, rely on uh, these uh, technical provisions when they seek to uh, use them, and I think a uh, good argument could be made here that where the defense now seeks to rely on this provision in the face of the fact that we now are prevented from asking these questions unless we comply with the provisions, that if we haven't complied with them, we could be uh, put in a somewhat embarrassing position. Uh, let's face it, uh, with the changes over the last few years, there's, uh, I think, a considerable amount of heat on uh, the Crown Attorney's Office in dealing with, with rape charges to see that they're prosecuted with due vigor. And uh, uh, community groups like the Rape Crisis Center are, uh, are uh, I think, pressuring the Crown's Office to uh, use all reasonable tactics to uh, see that uh, someone charged with rape is prosecuted with vigor. All right. Laura, what would you do to Bonnie Wine if she as a Crown Counsel tried to spring this uh, technical argument forward that uh, because notice was given at the preliminary but wasn't given to the clerk of the Supreme Court where it's actually being tried, what, what position would you take if you care to give us your ruling in advance? Well, I think obviously the purpose for requiring reasonable notice is to give the prosecutor and the complainant an opportunity to uh, consider the allegations and be uh, prepared for them. And uh, I would think that I would, uh, if called upon to make the ruling, would say if the Crown had been given notice months ago at the preliminary hearing that it had reasonable notice, and if there was some issue about uh, the notice being filed with the clerk of the court, I can't see why it couldn't be done right at the moment the objection is raised. Uh, so, uh, as far as the technicalities of, of notice, obviously, I would say, has the Crown had reasonable time to uh, consult with the complainant and consider the factual allegations? And uh, I think that's what is intended. Thank you. I think, Al, on a uh, practical point of view, Defense Counsel, uh, hopefully at the preliminary hearing, may have found out something which might be able to uh, bolster his, his notice, and he would be very well advised just from practical considerations to consider drafting a new notice before With new particulars. Trial. Yes. I see. All right, now, uh, sorry, me. Peter. Reasonable notice has been referred to in terms of, of time, but I, I, I submit that it also requires a sufficient particularity. Um, and uh, I can only suggest that you uh, look at the different cases to see what notices have or haven't been adequate uh, yes. in the eyes of the court. Uh, reasonable notice uh, might be quite particular again and yet not be um, uh, sufficiently uh, relevant. It might be too remote in time, that is, it might relate to some other transaction that's uh, irrelevant. Uh, I think you have to use the analogy of similar fact evidence as to what uh, is sufficiently connected uh, to be admissible. Okay. Now, I want to uh, ask you, Bonnie, what questions is the section designed to cover? For instance, if there's an allegation that the complainant had sex on a prior occasion with the accused, does the defense counsel have to go through 142? No, I, that's clearly not within section 142, and I think you have to go back to the categories I set out before, the common law categories. Obviously, uh, prior acts with the accused are not covered just by the wording of the section. With respect to the first two categories, there is some comment in foresight, as I mentioned, by Chief Justice Laskin, which suggests at least that the section may not be designed to cover general reputation. I guess if I was faced with an argument, it would be my submission that that is not really clear from the judgment. Uh, he indicates at page 286 of, of the judgment in the CRs, these last mentioned inquiries, and he's referring there specifically to acts of prostitution or reputation for prostitution, uh, and possibly to the whole area of general reputation for chastity, he says are not directly affected by section 142. That wasn't directly an issue in the case, and 
the comment was made in the context of considering whether the common law extended uh, the right to uh, bring extrinsic evidence, uh, which obviously can only apply to the situation concerning specific acts with others. That really is my greatest concern with the Forsyth decision. If it is limited in that respect, or if it arguably is limited in that respect, I would still have the comment with respect to two unreported judgments, both predating Forsyth uh, from the Ontario Court of Appeal, one from the Ontario Court of Appeal, Regina and Blondheim. And in that case, if you look at the type of questions that were set out, there was two questions concerning specific persons, the particulars were unknown. And a third question or area that it was proposed to ask questions about concerning sexual conduct with others that, in quotes, had given rise to the complainant's reputation as a sexually loose and promiscuous person. The Court of Appeal held that the notice generally was deficient uh, and that a hearing under Section 1B was not required, but I think the case also illustrates the line between general reputation questions and questions of specific acts is not always clear. If you look at the decision of Mr. Justice Eberly in the Murphy case as well, where there were allegations um, of prior alluring and sexually inviting conduct in a specific tavern leading to gen allegations of general conduct. Uh, it was noted that general conduct is not the same as general reputation, so that arguably general conduct, which is based on a series of specific acts, is still within Section 142, whatever uh, Chief Justice Laskin may have to say about the application. Blondheim and Murphy, the two cases referred to Bonnie, are both unreported, but they're mentioned in her table of cases along with the date that they came came down, so that sex with the accused uh, uh, by the complainant, you don't have to go within 142, you can just ask it. Um, general reputation as to chastity, or at least prostitution, perhaps chast chastity, uh, is not covered by 142, from what you say. But if you want to ask questions about, sp sp probably, specific sexual acts with people other than the accused, you do have to go through 142. And I think as a Crown, I would always try to argue that that's really what the defense was, was trying to do unless you got into the area of prostitution. All right. What about uh, reasonable notice? What is reasonable? How long do you have to serve the Crown? Any, Peter, would you care to comment upon this? Uh, reasonable notice. I, I really uh, don't think it matters much before preliminary. So far before the trial, I shouldn't think that notice would have to be very uh, long before in time. But uh, I, th I think it has to relate to uh, when the uh, circumstances in the notice uh, occurred and when they became available. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to uh, find out about the, the, the background of the complainant. Uh, the, the, it was the Lawson case where I feel that the uh, notice, uh, or at least uh, the Crown Attorney should have disclosed to the defense uh, the conduct or misconduct of the complainants on the eve of the size. They all, the complainants got drunk and disorderly or carried on, with, caroused with the various witnesses at the hotel, or was it Prince Rupert or some place like that? And they weren't able to come to court the next day. Now, there's a perfect case where the, not only the Crown should have disclosed that discreditable conduct to defense counsel, but the, if, uh, if they had uh, Crown counsel, then notice of that uh, on the morning of trial surely would have been adequate. It depends on the circumstances. Uh, that's Why did you look directly at Bonnie Wine when you asked where the Prince Rupert Hotel <laughs> 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 something we don't know. Um, Al, Al, uh, yes, Keith. On that uh, subject, it's, no, it's interesting to note the section doesn't say that the notice has to be before trial. So uh, <laughs> presumably in the Lawson situation, uh, and keeping in mind that uh, the timing of the actual application may be several days or weeks into the trial, it seems that notice after the trial is commenced is uh, still uh, perhaps within the, uh, the appropriate guidelines. And the McKenna decision uh, seems to suggest that the test is uh, 
simply does the Crown have enough time to sit down and talk about the matters referred to in the notice with the complainant so as to uh, be properly prepared to meet the, uh, the hearing. Well, McKenna was a half-day notice, but Bonnie Wine may have something to say about whether it was actually half a day or not. Well, the, the defense will tell you it's a half-day notice. If you're a Crown, you can point out that there was a two-week adjournment for written argument, so you can probably ask for the same thing. That's the shortest notice that I've ever seen. I suppose if the acts were acts like in Lawson where they're arising during the course of the trial, uh, obviously you, you can't get very much notice for that. Now, the... Uh when should the actual application be launched? Now, Lawson in the British Columbia Court of Appeal, it's mentioned in the table of cases, I believe said that it should be launched after examination in chief of the complainant, neither before or during cross-examination. Now, Keith Wright, could you tell us perhaps from defense counsel perspective when in your view it would be best to actually launch the uh, getting into the 142 hearing? Well, I would say, uh, tactically, you'd probably want to do it at the conclusion of your uh, general cross-examination of the complainant. I think you might reasonably expect that any hope you have of obtaining any favorable answers in cross-examination from the complainant might uh, uh, take a, a serious nosedive once you launch into your Section 142 application. So I, uh, I myself, unless there's some particular uh, reason why uh, I would depart from that rule and always want to do it at the end of my general cross-examination. So you think you might find something out in your cross-examination? I don't know whether I would find something out which was relevant to the Section 142 application, but I would think as far as just the, the general animus of the witness toward me and my questioning that uh, I would want to uh, go through the general questioning first before I get into this uh, somewhat sensitive area of the Section 142. I'm type not sure of I understand why, why tactically that would be advantageous to a defense counsel. Well, uh, very simply, if uh, she uh, feels that by getting into these questions, I'm uh, getting into areas which she ought not to be discussing, but which the, the judge has allowed this horrible defense counsel to be asking her then if I then subsequently to that want to go into general cross-examination, I would say her disposition to be uh, friendly and helpful to me in my cross-examination would be uh, seriously impaired. You think it would, my lord, being an old defen older defense counsel? <laughs> <laughs> You're still a young man, I want to. I <laughs> Perhaps, uh, naturally enough, one's perspective changes, depends on where you're sitting. Uh, as a judge, uh, I like the practice that's now being developed of getting a lot of contentious uh, proceedings relating to the admissibility of evidence dealt with in bulk before the jury uh, starts to, to hear evidence rather than doing them uh, bits and pieces, sending the jury in and out. And there is a practice now pretty well developed for, for voir dires as to the admissibility of confessions and uh, disputes as to whether evidence that uh, the jury be picked, sent away, and uh, the hours or days that are necessary to determine those issues are taken up and then the jury's brought back and the evidence flows along. Uh, there is uh, pending uh, in a draft bill that is yet to be placed before Parliament a procedure where somewhat similar to the American uh, system uh, of dealing with all of these matters even before the jury is selected. And it would seem to me that that would be the appropriate time to do it. Uh, I better let defense counsel decide on their own tactics of when uh, they would like to do it in the uh, context of, of their uh, cross-examination. But I would like to see that together with a lot of similar matters dealt with uh, at the very beginning before the jury has heard any evidence and then the matter can flow along. The questions can either be asked uh, of the complainant if the ruling is in favor of the accused or she's not bothered with them at all if the uh, ruling has been in the Crown favor. So that uh, if Defense and Crown agreed and asked you to let it 
be commenced before any evidence is called. Do you go along with that? Certainly. I think the federal criminal rules uh, in the United States uh, allow They call them motions to suppress, I think, is the technical term they use. But they're really pre-jury uh, selection, so the, the jury isn't sitting out in their uh, jury room or sent away for a few days, that they just hear virtually all the rulings as to admissibility are made in advance, and then the evidence rolls along, and the jury hears the case continuously. Do you still stick to your uh, position, Keith, that that wouldn't be advisable, that you should wait until you've actually cross-examined the uh, complainant in general? Yes, I, I think generally speaking, I'd uh, make a fairly vociferous objection to uh, this happening just because of the fact that probably I'm going to be wanting to call the complainant uh, during this hearing. Uh, it's in a slightly different category, I think, than a lot of the other other matters, and uh, I would hope, as the law stands right now, defense counsel, if he insisted on waiting, uh, would be allowed to, to do so, because technically no problem has arisen before the jury is, uh, hears any evidence. Okay. Now, dealing with particulars, um, what is meant, and Bonnie, I'm going to ask you this, by the phrase section, the intention to ask such question together with particulars of the evidence sought to be adduced. Now, with that phrase in mind, I ask you, do the actual questions that defense counsel want to ask have to be set out in the particulars? Well, it's, it's clear from the decision in Forsyth that they don't, and I, I suggest that that makes sense. Uh, there's no way you could set out each and every question. However, Chief Justice Laskin does note that ordinarily, you would need to have set out the time, place, and names of, of the prior sexual conduct. So that, in my submission, is, would be very specific. Um, if that wasn't the case, I think the Crown could argue that there's no reason why the defense shouldn't have that. Clearly can't go on a fishing expedition, so the defense can't argue, well, I'm, I'm going to find that out after I ask the complainant. Um, I think the defense has to do its homework in advance, and, and that has to be established in the notice. So it's, uh, it's subject matter being particularized as opposed to actual questions? I think so, yes. All right. Time, place, and names. Is that basically what Forsyth seems to say? Yes, and I, I think the, the Crown can expect that the defense will almost always meet that test. All right. Now, when we're dealing with the particulars, you've already say that your technical requirements are flawless. You've served the uh, notice in writing to the Crown and the clerk of the particular <coughs> court. Uh, so it hasn't been struck out for that reason. Uh, you, you're setting out your particulars, and can a judge just say, I don't find that they're adequate without hearing any evidence, just looking at the written uh, document, and just throw out the 142 application at that point? Yeah, I, th I think he can, and I think there's uh, judicial support for that position in both the decision in Lonesbury, which was affirmed by the Court of Appeal, and the decision of Blondheim, uh, in Lonesbury, following McKenna concerning particulars, uh, it was held that the particulars were so remote in time as to be irrelevant mm -hmm. and that the Crown had to set out the purpose so that if you don't meet that test under subsection 1A, you don't even get into subsection 1B. Uh, similarly, in Blondheim, it was held that there was no loss of jurisdiction by reason of the fact that the trial judge refused to get into the in-camera hearing. So clearly, there's a discretion there that he can the whole notice can be knocked out just on the basis that you're, you're not even close uh, without even contemplating calling any witnesses at the in-camera hearing. Some of the cases talk about, uh, they say, okay, it, it, it looks good, the particulars look good, but it's remote in time, so it has to go out in that ground. Is that that's, right? That's the Lonesbury situation. So, my lord, if you were uh, looking at the dry page, written page, and you saw that there was an incident which, if it were fresh, it would certainly be something you might let go to a hearing, a 142 hearing, but you saw that it happened two or three years ago, would you just uh, dismiss the application at that juncture? Well, that uh, is not an easy question to answer without getting to what I think is the more fundamental question of which, with all deference to them, I don't think the Supreme Court of Canada answered, is when is uh, evidence 
of uh, previous sexual activity admissible? What is the test? Forget all the problems of notice and everything else, but when it gets to the point of, of when is such evidence admissible? Uh, you know, it, it used to be, and I, I pulled out a charge by a very well-known uh, and highly respected judge of our court that was 15 years old. Now, there's some of us that um, think 50, 15 years is very, very recent. I know by looking around here, there's some of you that think that it's antiquity. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't seem like antiquity to me. And this is what a judge said, dealing with this very problem in a specific case. And I'm just knocking out a few words to uh, get the matter into uh, context. He said to the jury, in these cases, the character of the complainant always comes in issue. It becomes material only as to whether the complainant is likely to consent to intercourse. The background of a woman is indicative of whether or not she is more or less likely to refuse to have intercourse. Now, in uh, Potter and Constantini, uh, which is much more recent, uh, be two years in January, Mr. Justice Eberly said that, uh, and I think held according to modern thinking that the fact of prior sexual activity is not sufficient. He didn't use the word relevant, but I think that's what he meant, that there must be established some relevance of the prior sexual behavior to the particular incident with which the accused is charged. Now, I can see, getting back to the question I was asked about notice, the mere fact that the notice relates to incidents some time ago, I find to be uh, a little difficult to accept as necessarily uh, excluding the evidence as much as I would find that very recent events wouldn't necessarily rule the line of questioning or the evidence admissible. Uh, I think a little further on in the discussion, we're going to uh, get into more of a discussion about when this kind of evidence is relevant and admissible or when it isn't. But for the moment, I would have some trouble in declining to give the accused the right to elicit that evidence merely because it referred to time. There are two parts to that section. There's A and B. And I'm not sure that, uh, except in the most obvious case, it is wise to refuse to admit the evidence just because the notice appears to be uh, defective. Uh, I agree it must be reasonable, but to be able to look at the notice and say this is, is uh, inadmissible troubles me. I don't mean that viva voce evidence has to be given under paragraph B, but I think defense counsel must be given an opportunity. The, the evidence may relate to and my favorite example of this, and I'll be talking about this later, is a situation where it appears to me that prior sexual activity is obviously relevant and admissible if the defense is that this woman was a prostitute, I didn't pay her, and uh, she's yelled rape uh, to get back at me for failing to pay for her. Well, it may be that the notice suggests that there are several acts of, of uh, sexual intercourse with different people a year ago and nothing's happened in the meantime. Well, if you just rely on the notice uh, and throw the accused out, his rights out, I think it would be wrong because 
defense counsel may have a very good explanation of why she did nothing for a year. She might have been hit by a truck and uh, out of commission for a year, and she's just now getting back in business. Uh, so I, I would be loath, assume, uh, uh, assuming Section A is complied with in the circumstances in the sense that been uh, mentioned earlier that there is reasonable notice of the allegations. I'd be loath to refuse to consider uh, whether the evidence is relevant, and I think it's in paragraph B that the court must go into that uh, consideration. May I? Yes, Peter. Yes. Um, I don't think anybody's going to convince anybody as to whether it's relevant. I uh, may be accused of being a chauvinist, but I submit that a female's uh, past uh, in this field is relevant. But I think that Parliament, as a matter of policy, has declared that it's not admissible. And uh, it's, uh, it's similar to the, the, the common law principle that uh, the record of an accused is not admissible. That is uh, his, his, his character, unless he puts it in issue. So, uh, even though it may be relevant, uh, Parliament has made that a declaration of po uh, policy, and that's what we have to face. And, and to overcome that declaration, you have to have some cogent uh, evidence to, to, to render it admissible. You almost have to go like into the similar act cases. All right, it seems from Forsyth that uh, if the notice uh, is limited in particular such that the judge at that stage would throw it out that he then has the power to allow the defense to amend the notice. This happened in a case I had not so long ago where the uh, defense had scurried about on the weekend and uh, sent private investigators into a bar and come up with a lot of very, uh, what looked like cogent evidence. And we were presented this on uh, the Monday morning of the trial and uh, I uh, expressed uh, my concern to uh, the judge in question that this was caught us completely by surprise and he adjourned it from Monday to Thursday, allowed the defense to file new protectors and gave me a chance to go over with the complainant, which I think is fair. Um, the argument uh, concerning particulars is supposed to, according to Foresight, I believe, if not Bonnie, supposed to take place in camera? Yeah, both um, that argument and also the, the raising of the notice takes place in camera. I might point out that it seems to me that that provides the uh, complainant with a greater protection than is provided by statute under section 142. Uh, if the argument takes place in camera and can't be, can't be published, then uh, she's totally protected in the situation where she doesn't have to testify as, as well as the situation where she does. The whole argument is covered. So Crown Counsel uh, should bear that in mind then, that that should be done in camera. Yes, and I think they should make sure that the, the courtroom is clear. All right, getting to the actual hearing itself, this is where the judges decide if we've got past the technical requirements of the notice and particulars are okay, uh, the particulars in the notice seem to be fine, we get to the stage now where the judge has to decide who can be called and in what order. Now, the onus, uh, I hope everyone agrees, appears to be on the balance of probabilities. Did the O'Brien case mention that, uh, Keith? Newfoundland? I'm not sure. I know the uh, decision of Mr. Justice Eberly and Murphy uh, mentions it very clearly, and uh, I think general, uh, general dicta in the Supreme Court of Canada seem to be fairly clear that uh, it would take incredibly express words of Parliament to put any higher onus on an accused. All right, now as one of the counsel, the defense counsel, in fact, who argued Forsyth in the Supreme Court of Canada, what does it really mean as to whether or not the complainant can be called as a witness at all? If so, uh, what order can she be called first? I must say that I have difficulty in understanding exactly what uh, Chief Justice Laskin is saying in that regard. Could you assist us? I'm not sure. <laughs> this is the uh, issue that we it? both lost, I guess. Uh, well, the, I think the part of the judgment that worries me the most is the uh, discretion which uh, seems to now reside in the trial judge to decide to uh, hear no evidence at all. Uh, on its face, section 142 does not seem to contemplate this in-between ground where the uh, trial judge can take a, can, uh, 
uh, say, well, I want to hear submissions. He has already ruled the notices uh, proper, and he says, I want to hear submissions now as to what, what you're going to be leading by way of evidence, I guess, and uh, I am going to decide whether evidence needs to be called in this particular case. The Supreme Court of Canada, however, have made it very clear that that is the right of the judge, but then goes on to say that if the judge does decide that he is going to allow evidence to be heard, then the complainant is uh, compellable. Uh, they suggest that there may be reasons why the judge would decide not to hear evidence, and examples of given are given of the evidence being too remote or such that the prejudice, prejudicial value outweighs the probative value. Uh, Chief Justice Laskin goes on to say that once the judge decides to hear evidence, it would be a rare case where the accused would be denied his right to call evidence. So I think that from the defense counsel point of view, your big hurdle to get over once you've got past the notice problem is to convince the judge that this is a case that requires the hearing of evidence. And if you take a careful look at the Forsyth decision and really at the section, you'll see that the section talks about the credibility of the complainant as being one of the issues of fact in the proceedings. And the strong argument, I think, can be made that it's very difficult for uh, any issue of credibility to be decided by merely hearing submissions made. Uh, once you convince a judge that you're allowed to hear evidence, then it seems the complainant is completely, clearly a witness who you may call as your own witness. Does it seem then, Keith, that the uh, trial judge is left with an awful lot of discretion to say, first of all, whether any evidence can be called at all, and if so, whether the complainant can be called, and if so, whether she should be called first or not? As far as the, I, I would agree, uh, uh, the only thing that, that troubles me is this question of uh, whether the uh, complainant may be called first. Uh, this was uh, apparently the, the fundamental reason why the appeal in Forsyth was dismissed since uh, there, there had been uh, a ruling that the, uh, there was a requirement, this was according to Mr. Justice Hollingworth, there was a requirement that the uh, defense counsel had to show some good and proper reason for calling the complainant first, otherwise he had to establish a basis for uh, calling her. That is, he had to call other evidence, supposedly other people who had uh, had sexual relations with her of some form, and he had to call those other people first, and then he could call her to, uh, to go into this matter further. Uh, Chief Justice Laskin said that whereas he didn't view that as a rigid rule to be followed all the time, he was unable to find that there would be a denial of natural justice in the Forsyth case uh, as a result of applying that rule, and therefore the, the appeal which had sought to quash the committal for trial was refused. Well, do you think that it's crown that uh, uh, the judge pretty well, uh, at least from an objective point of view, uh, that the, the, judge, the trial judge can do pretty well what he or she wants to do as far as who to call and what order? If well, evidence is to be well I think so. Uh, Chief Justice Laskin says there's a discretion in a judge or magistrate holding an in-camera hearing during a preliminary inquiry as to the order in which witnesses may be called. Um, That's at the prelim. What about the trial? Judge or magistrate. So I, I think it applies equally. I think the Crown ought to argue that if there is going to be um, some contradictory evidence in the form of other witnesses, that um, it's only reasonable but that they be heard first and assessed by the judge before he starts to put the complainant through anything. And I, I think in most cases a judge would go along with that. 